Welcome to Sure Foundation Lutheran Church's podcast channel. If this podcast is something that you find to be a blessing throughout your week, could I ask you to, to give us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you use? And also hit subscribe. This helps us be seen by more people more often. Thank you and enjoy this week's podcast. pray. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What is it that you're, you're good at? Maybe it's not something you, you like to say out loud too much because it, it kind of sounds like bragging. But I'm guessing, at the very least, you have a rough idea of where your skills and abilities lie. It's good to be good at, at something. It's good to be good at something because a lot of times, the things that, that, that you're good at, you also really enjoy doing. It might become your hobby or your passion or your, your career, something along those lines. But we don't just want to be good. We want to be great. We want to be remembered for our, our skills, our abilities, our talents. We, we want to leave a legacy behind us and be, be remembered by, by people based on, on the work that we do here on earth, based on, on the unique talents that, that we have been given. Uh, we want to be like somebody like Michael Jordan or Pablo Picasso or Jimi Hendrix or Emily Dickinson who weren't just good they, they were great. But if we're honest, most don't have the, the talents or the abilities to reach that level of greatness. And even those that, that do have the potential to reach that level of greatness maybe lack the willpower or the follow-through to, to make that happen. But that doesn't mean the desire for greatness goes away. We still all want to be great. Which is the very thing the disciples are, are wrestling with today. Our gospel was recorded for us in, in Mark. That's the one we're going to be walking through a little bit today. But it's, the same account is also recorded in, in Matthew. So we'll walk through the Mark account, but I'll bring in just a few details from the Matthew account as well. So, uh, James and John, who were brothers... Uh, they approach Jesus with a, a request. That's how the Mark Gospel reads. In Matthew, it says that their mother, whose name was Salome, she appears at different points in the Bible too after Jesus rose from the dead. She was there too. And, and the Matthew account says she was even the one that brought this request to Jesus on behalf of her, her sons, James and John. Regardless, they bring this pretty presumptuous request. The very first one says, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. You can learn a lot about James and John and their mother Salome from just this one simple question. It shows you how bold they were. It shows you how they perceived their relationship with, with Jesus, and maybe because they're asking for a carte blanche yes before, before they ask their real question, they, they maybe realized that Jesus wasn't going to respond positively to what they had to, to ask them. But, but Jesus humors them. He says, what is it that you want? What, what can I do for you, Jesus said. And so they proceed to, to ask Jesus, when you enter your kingdom, when you, when you go sit on your, your throne, can we please have the seats to the right and to the left of you? I know I just did that in opposite order, but it was your right and my left. Can we have those seats? Now, now to us, maybe that, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal, right? They just want to sit close to Jesus. But 
what they were actually asking Jesus was to give them the positions of great honor and great authority sitting to the right and left of the glorified Savior. This, this was a, a big request that they were making. So, if we put the best construction on this, on the disciples' request, we'd have to say it would be something like, we want to just be really close to Jesus. It was a de- desire for James and John to just be right next to Jesus. That's, that's maybe the best construction we can put on it. If we put the worst construction on it, it's that James and John wanted glory, they wanted honor, they wanted to be great, and they wanted Jesus to give that greatness to, him, to them. And either way, whether we put the best construction or the worst, there's probably some element of glory-seeking going on here, some level of selfishness going on for, for James and for John. From this interaction, James and John aren't the only ones that we can learn something about, though. We can also learn something about Jesus from this interaction. Because Jesus could have become angry with the disciples. This was just yet another time where the disciples didn't seem to get it. Their their heads were were other places. They, They completely just didn't understand. But you notice how Jesus responds with great calmness, he just points out the misguided nature of their request and he says this, you don't know what you're, what you're asking. It's pretty clear that the disciples saw Jesus as the Messiah. And when we use that word Messiah, we're talking about the promised Savior, the promised Messiah, the anointed one from the Old Testament. It was what the Israelites were looking forward to. They were looking forward to the promised Messiah. And it was clear that the disciples saw Jesus as the Messiah. And so when they're talking about sitting next to his throne on his right and his left, it's clear also that they are thinking of his messianic kingdom. But it is also clear that the disciples think this messianic kingdom is some kind of earthly kingdom, not, not, a, not a heavenly kingdom. Kingdom. And so when they ask Jesus to sit on his right and on his left, they're thinking when Jesus takes his earthly throne, they want to sit on the, uh, the right and the left. After all, they want it to be great. So Jesus has some more teaching to do here. And he asks them two questions. He says, first of all, can you drink the cup that I am drinking? And then he says, can you be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Now we hear some of those words and and maybe we we think of other parts of of Scripture as well. When we hear, can you drink the cup that I am drinking, we can fast forward in, in time from this interaction to when Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because you remember maybe some of the words that he said. He said, Father, if this cup can be taken from me, let it be so, but not as I will, as, as you will. The, the cup that Jesus was praying about in the Garden of Gethsemane was a cup of wrath, a cup of suffering. This was the, the wrath that God had towards sin. God, God's uh, wrath towards sin was his judgment on sin. Sin cannot stand before a holy God, and, and the cup of suffering was the suffering that, that was needed as punishment for that sin. That's the cup that Jesus came to drink. That's the cup he's talking about here. The, the baptism that he's talking about here is not the, the water and the word kind of baptism. It's not the baptism that, that you, you have received. Baptism was also a way to talk about death. But when, when they used baptism here, they're talking about baptism of, of blood, a baptism into death. They would talk about it in such a way that it was a plunging into the, the depths. That's how they talked about death. And so baptism lined up with how they would think about these things. So, so with, with these words, with the cup and with the baptism, Jesus is trying to remind his disciples what he had predicted a long time ago. He predicted it three times for the disciples. That Jesus, as the Son of Man, he came to die on the cross for sins. That before he would go sit on his throne, there would be pain and suffering. Before he would receive his crown, there would be a cross. 
This wasn't something that, that computed for the disciples, for James and, and for John at this moment. They, they may look back on it later and, and understand what Jesus was saying, but they didn't understand this here. So, so did the disciples, James and John, did they really think that they could drink that cup? Did they really think that they could be baptized with that baptism? But they say, we can! <laughs> Either the height of arrogance or the height of ignorance, or maybe a combination of, of both. But Jesus said, yeah, you'll participate in this, meaning that the disciples will die. Many of them will die for their, their faith. But to your first question, disciples, to sit on my right or to sit on my left That is not something for me to grant. But lest we think that James and John were the only glory seekers here, Mark tells us about a couple others. The other ten disciples, they they came on the, the scene here. They weren't too far away, but they came and then they heard what James and John had asked of of Jesus. And they were indignant with, with James and John. But not because of the nature of their question but because they didn't get to ask it first. (laughs) They would have wanted to ask Jesus the very same question. But but Jesus says, this isn't the way the kingdom of God works. This is the way the kingdom of the world works. This is the way unbelievers work. People desire and seek after glory and honor and, and power and authority and greatness for themselves. And when they get to that Point where they obtain that greatness and that power and authority, they don't use it to serve others. They use it to serve themselves. They take that power and they take that authority and they lord it over others as tyrants, not seeking to serve but seeking to be served. Although Jesus is talking about unbelieving tyrants, unbelieving leaders, Unfortunately, we can see that that same tyrant in our own hearts. We want to be great. And we want to be considered great by others. And sometimes that desire reveals itself in, in pretty obvious ways. Like trying to amass my own little kingdom here on earth and and expecting selfishly that Jesus is going to help me amass this little kingdom of mine here on earth, like working tirelessly with the only motivation, with the only motivation being to, to up my greatness, to, to make others look at me as, as being great. That's the obvious tyrant in my heart. But a lot of times, it's not so obvious. This, this little tyrant in, in my heart, uh, delights in nothing more than than finding the secret thoughts of my heart. As I I sit back and I pine over recognition from from others. As we just want acknowledgement, we just want others to to look at us and say, that that person is great, that person is, is special. As we envy the praise that others get, because we think that we should have that That praise. A lot of times it reveals itself in the secret thoughts of my heart, the ones that no one else gets to hear. And when I realize that, then I start to think, maybe I'm not so different than the glory-seeking attitude of James and John. Maybe I'm not so different than than the envious nature of, of the other ten disciples. Everyone wants to be honored. Everybody wants to be glorified, even Christians. And our sinful nature feeds this desire for earthly greatness while spurning the thought of suffering. We want the glory without the suffering. But what Jesus is is trying to remind the disciples, and, and he's trying to explain this, he's done it multiple times, is that he didn't come to earth for earthly greatness, earthly honor, earthly glory. He didn't come to establish his earthly kingdom. He came to bring a different kind of kingdom with a different message. Now, now don't get me wrong. Jesus could have created the greatest earthly kingdom of all time. It would have been a kingdom where where no other kingdom could match that level 
of greatness. Jesus would have ruled with such power and authority, and he could have lorded it over everyone else. But consistently throughout his life, he didn't. He set aside his greatness and chose to be a servant of all. He didn't vainly seek recognition or power, but but he lived a humble life, which is evidence from the very beginning. We're coming up on on the time where we're going to celebrate this. From the very beginning when he was born in, in humility, in a stable, to a teenager. When he he lived in poverty in the country town of Nazareth. His humble life is is evidenced by the fact that this is the God of the universe who became a human. The most humbling act of all. And he did it all for a purpose. He did it all to save you. That was his mission. And so when you open your Bible and you see Jesus doing things like fasting for 40 days in the wilderness and then squaring off against the devil and defeating him, he did that so that you could be confident and you could trust that he has defeated the power of the devil for good. He did this so that when you see Jesus in his, in his word showing compassion and kindness to, to tax collectors, prostitutes, and other people who were considered sinners at that time, that you could believe and trust that God came, Jesus came, to buy you back from the sin that used to own you. He did it so that when you open the Bible and you read that he was amassing these massive crowds of people who wanted to come hear him preach and do miracles, that he still, in every moment, gave all honor and glory to his Father and kept his eyes resolutely fixed on the cross so that you could believe with 100% certainty that he came not for his own earthly glory, but he came for suffering. He came for you. He came to drink the cup and be baptized with that baptism. He came to, to buy you back from sin, death, and the devil, to pay the ransom price for you. And so we find that true greatness doesn't come from us. Even the great men and women of this world are eventually forgotten. But true greatness comes from Christ. If you want a legacy that will last a long time, even to eternity, that's the legacy that Christ gives to you. It's the Father saying that that you get to have heaven forever, with unending greatness. It's a legacy where where the Father looks at you and he sees the greatness that Christ has given you. And so we don't seek to be served, but we seek to serve. And it's with a heart that understands the gospel and is motivated by that gospel that we serve others and we seek to do that rather than be served. We seek to give rather than be consumers. And we ask Jesus to help us do all of this but because we know that even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Amen.